Out spake brave Horatius, the captain of the gate. To every man upon this earth, death cometh soon or late. And how can man die better than facing fearful odds? For the ashes of his fathers and the temples of his gods. When Ashling sat on the pristine beach, the universe itself seemed to align. The waters of the Irish Sea lapped at her feet, sweeping away the heat of the midday sun. In front of her, crystal blue water as far as the eye could see. The whole scene was peaceful, serene. Ashling was meditating on the shores of Ireland. The real Ireland. Behind her, the city of Dublin dominated the horizon, the hustle and bustle of cars and trains punctuated by the distant thunder of airplanes. This was what Ashling had decided to do with her last two days in the real world. Visit the real Ireland. Callie, Hurton, and the Paradox CEO made it happen. Ashling's plane landed in Dublin, and Callie, Marisol, Lorcan, and Ushka escorted her to the sea. While Ashling meditated on the beaches of North Bull Island, Ushka had waded into the Irish Sea, getting so far away from shore that she was submerged up to her chest. Then Ushka took a deep breath and floated on her back, allowing the waves to carry her slowly back to shore. Callie, Marisol, and Lorcan watched Ashling in silence, allowing her to make this moment her own. Ashling focused her mind on the world around her. Callie had told her this was Ireland, but it felt off to Ashling. She was hoping to regain some connection to the other world, or perhaps contact other Fey people, but there was nothing. Ashling's tour of Ireland, sponsored by Paradox Interactive, lasted for just one day. Callie ensured she stuck to a tight schedule and Marisol never left her side. From Dublin, Ashling's little entourage traveled north and spent three hours at the Hill of Tara. While a tour guide educated Marisol about the site's cultural and historical significance, Ashling walked the perimeter in a spiral, doing several laps around the Stone of Destiny before she dared draw close enough to stand in its shadow. She did not try to touch the stone as the tour guide confessed that there was some doubt as to whether this was the actual Stone of Destiny or a replica. After that, Ashling spent nearly half an hour just sitting in the grass in front of the Mound of the Hostages. Ashling knew that in her own story, the Mound of the Hostages would have been an entrance to the other world, a direct link to the Fey people from whence she came. If there was anywhere in Ireland she could have regained her powers, this would have been it. Yet, nothing happened. No fairies came to greet her. No miracles occurred. Instead, a group of teenagers climbed atop the ancient burial mound and rolled down its grassy slopes. Ashley took a deep breath, allowing the fresh air to purge the disappointment from her system. She laid flat on her back shifting her mind to the world around her, trying to take in as much of the real Ireland as possible. About 90 minutes later, the Paradox Entourage drove across the international border between the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom. Ashling giggled as she watched Marisol trying to spot the difference between Irish towns and British ones. Just two hours before sunset, large shapes began to loom out of the gray clouds on the distant road ahead. Sitting in the back seat of the luxury van, Ashling asked, Are those the Morn Mountains? They were. For the first time in what felt like months, 
Ashling had returned home. The Morn Mountains were very different from what Ashling had known in her story. Several dams had been constructed in the various rivers, flooding the valleys and turning them into long, thin lakes. Paved roads and stone walls were now the most prominent landmarks. The final stop on Ashling's journey was Tollymore Forest Park, just outside Bryan's Ford and at the northernmost leading edge of the Morn Mountains. According to Blake and Marisol, this was the approximate location of Ashling's fairy tree in Last Days of the Emerald Isle. We fudged the location of Clow Castle, Marisol confessed. Your tree, Clow, and Ulster Castle were all meant to be closer together. So we put Clow just up there to the north and slapped Ulster into the spot where the city of Newcastle is now. Marisol pointed to the southeast. A seaside resort town was located in the sleepy cove where the Morn Mountains met the Irish Sea. With her companions following behind, Ashling wandered through Tollymore Forest. Ushka somehow managed to get a spring in her step, despite having spent the whole day driving and walking across the Irish countryside. The Water Witch was fascinated by the many stone bridges which crossed streams and creeks in the forest, each older than the last. Ashling only had eyes for the trees. Tollymore Forest was young, very young. The trees were skinny and spaced far enough apart as though deliberately placed by a careful gardener. The footpaths were wide enough for cars, and there was something about the wildlife that just felt different. Not wrong, but different from what she knew. The sun finally set while Ashling and Ushka were admiring a small waterfall deep in the forest. When Lorcan, Callie, and Marisol said it was time to leave, the two girls departed reluctantly, agreeing that Tollymore Forest was the best part of the trip. Back on the road, the Paradox employee drove the van towards the airport in Belfast, where a private jet was waiting. Did you enjoy getting to see your home again, Ashling? Marisol asked through the interpreter. I was happy I got to see the real Ireland, but it's not home without Dermot. Marisol pulled her own shirt over her face so that no one would hear her squealing. In any other circumstance, Kiri would have said this was stupid and refused to go along with it. But he knew this opportunity may never rise again. So he seized it. Standing outside of the panda house at the Copenhagen Zoo, Kiri brushed the dust off his turtleneck and turned to his companions one last time. <sighs> All right, how do I look? He asked. Like a winner, Varian replied. Like the best man in this park, Akira replied. Tall, dark, and handsome. Nothing left to say. Cassandra said in a sultry tone. Ditto all of that, Blake finished. Now, Kiri, remember what Cassandra said. How does she look? Nice, Kiri said, injecting confidence into his voice. What are her stories? Akira asked. Interesting, Kiri answered. And who's going to pay for this outing? Varian asked, simultaneously pushing a stack of euros into Kiri's palm. I am, Kiri declared. Cassandra slapped Kiri's rear end. Go get her, handsome, she said. And just like that, Kiri set off for his first date in the real world. Mina was waiting for him at the entrance of the panda house. She was heavily laden with zoo souvenirs and accessories, making her look as colorful as a rainbow. Mina witnessed the pep talk Kiri received and fell into a fit of giggles as he approached. She blew a kiss to Blake and the creations before taking Kiri's outstretched hand and allowing him to lead her away. As the two lovers vanished inside the panda house, Akira said, That was the most fun I've had playing matchmaker in my life. You get half credit, Blake said. They were an established couple already. We just needed to relight the spark. Also, Marisol's gonna kill me when I tell her she missed this. Jericho, Toa Mami, and Mira 
arrived at the Rypersborg's bathhouse and reserved one of the mixed sauna rooms. The trio of protagonists got to enjoy about five minutes of blissful warmth and silence before the sauna door opened and the rest of their party entered. Dak, Mocha, and Callie entered the sauna together, peering around in wonderment while Herton and Bella raised their eyebrows at each other. In Sweden, first-time visitors to the sauna were very easy to spot. Mocha and Toa Mami seemed to be two peas grown from the same pod, as they entered a state of deep relaxation after sitting in the steam for just a few moments. Callie finally let her guard down and dropped her stern demeanor, briefly leaning on Dak's shoulder before regaining her composure. Herton spoke to Jericho. I'm glad to see you took my advice and gave yourself a day off. You are right, Jericho said twirling her long blue hair in one hand. Your employees can handle most of the logistics on their own. Now all I have to think about is whether I want to take any souvenirs with me when I leave. Souvenirs? Mocha repeated. We can take stuff with us from the real world. Blake and I have been working on it, Jericho said. You see, the thing is, it's not possible for the reality perforator to send us back to the exact moments in our stories we were taken from. It would create really bad anachronisms that could destroy the story. Mira Mihaka leaned forward and took over. The easiest way to get everyone back into their stories is to just embrace Blake's multiverse concept. When a creation is sent back, a new branch of their story will be created. An alternate timeline, a parallel reality, multiverse pocket, call it whatever you like. But that's what we have to do. A new version of the story will start at the point where the creation reappears. Dak frowned. Would that require any work on the creator's end? He asked. It will, Jericho said. Blake has already agreed to write amended narration to accommodate certain requests from a few of the creations. I'm getting a boyfriend, Mira declared cheerfully, flashing the thumbs up sign. I'm going to a timeline where I saved Nia, Toa Mommy said. In my story, she's a friend of mine, and I was tricked into killing her. I'm so happy for you, Kelly said. I'm going to ask Blake to write coffee into my world. I don't know what I'm going to do without coffee. Then she looked over at Herton. Gonna miss working for Paradox, though. It was fun. It was an honor and a privilege to have you with us, Dakara, Herton said. So, like, what are you going to ask Blake for? Bella said to Dak and Mocha. He can write anything you want into your story, you know. Saunas, Dak said. We need these things in our world. This is heavenly. Stories, Mocha replied. Books, movies, TV, video games. All the many types of fiction you've got here. Now that I've seen a world full of them, my world seems empty by comparison. Sepakira and Conti stood alongside several dozen Paradox Interactive employees, watching uncertainly as Emily knelt down in front of the casket. They were standing in a graveyard about twenty miles to the south of Stockholm, where Aaron Bowie was being quietly laid to rest. Emily, who had traded her normal red dress for a black one, muttered a melodic prayer over Aaron's body that could have been a short song. Yoba, please harmonize with her energy. Don't let Malam's deception be her last memory. Give her peace. After a few moments, Emily stood and backed away. Sebakira wrapped her tail around Emily's legs, and Conti lowered her head as Aaron's coffin was lowered into the ground. The creations could not stay long. Paradox employees quickly ushered them into a van for the long ride back to Malmo. Once they were on the road, Conti struck up a conversation. Emily and Conti were able to understand each other, but Sebakira could only follow along using telepathy. Emily, did you ever figure out what request you'd make before going back to your world? No, I haven't, Emily confessed. Thing is, I don't have any huge plans for life. I prefer not to stress about the future. 
I wish I could have a life as peaceful as yours, Conti said. I have to think about my people, how I'm going to lead them to a new home world. It's a serious responsibility. It doesn't have to be yours alone, Emily suggested. Why not ask Blake to give you some friends? Someone to help you? Conti perked up. Sebakira looked at her and nodded vigorously. Under the watchful eye of six Paradox bodyguards, Trick and Tenna held hands as they approached Lovelock Point. This was a place in Malmo Harbor where a walkway extended away from the city and into the water before tapering off to form a pointed lookout spot. From here, Trick and Tenna would enjoy a spectacular view of both the harbor and city, but that was only part of the reason they were here today. It was Tenna's idea. She had telepathically probed some of the locals and learned about this tradition. It took a few minutes of miming and telepathy, but she was able to convey to Blake, Marisol, and the PDX team her wish. Now, after patiently waiting for their turn, Trig and Tenna reached the narrow end of Lovelock Point and looked down. Padlocks. Hundreds of them. Countless young couples had come here to do what Trig and Tenna would do now. I've been thinking, Tenna said. In the last few chapters of our story, I confessed my love for Malum. I said he was my Ethera. I remember that, Trig said. I also remember the traditions of your people are really strict. Malum might not be a threat anymore, but he is still alive. If the Valdemar find out you went back on your oath to Malum and picked me instead... Sagri, Tenna said, using a word from the Valdem language. I'll be marked for an honor killing. I'll be a wanted woman on our homeworld. The two teenagers looked at one another. Didn't the homeworld get blown up in our story? Trig said. Maybe no one will care if one girl walked back her love vow. Besides, you were definitely under duress when you said it. Trig and Tenna shared a nervous laugh. You know, I always felt disconnected from my culture, Tenna said. Valdemar culture, I mean. And then you and Pentua and Ponico and the others were so good to me. Join the Birkin, Tenna, Trig said in a tone mimicking movie villains. We have acceptance and cookies. This time, they laughed out loud. I miss having moments like these, Tenna said, and she hugged Trig. Well, let's go back to our story and have some more, Trig said. But first, he reached into his pocket and produced a gold padlock. Blake had given it to him. And even if Trigg could, he would not ask how Blake had gotten a hold of it. They worked together to fasten the lock onto the metal railing, clicked it shut, and turned the key one last time. Trigg pulled Tenna into his embrace, and they shared a very long overdue kiss. As the teen heroes lost themselves in the moment, Trigg allowed the key to slip from his hand. It clattered onto the deck where Tenna kicked it into the sea. And joy shall overtake us Everything that is good and divine Truth and peace and love will come So every night upon this earth Death cometh soon or late And how can man die better than facing fearful odds For the ashes of his fall of his gods.